Hello everyone, I'm Greg Bendy and welcome to the ProgCast. Today we have a very special guest, someone that I've admired for, for many, many years. has been a tremendous inspiration and influence on me and so many creative musicians. He's a guitarist, a composer, an improviser, educator, and conceptualist. He's had a huge presence on the creative music scene over the last 50 years. And I'm so happy to be speaking with him today. Welcome, Fred Frith, how are you? Good, thank you. Nice to see you. Sure. <laughs> I think the last time I saw you was in uh, Brazil. I wanted to mention that <laughs> because that was the summer of 89. Uh -huh. uh, I had been playing with Cecil Taylor's band for a few year, a few months. And uh, you were on the same tour with Naked City. That's right. In Brazil, we did a few shows down there. What are your your memories of that trip? Because my understanding was it was the first time that outsider music had come into Brazil and played uh, concerts for people. And I remember people being really perplexed by Cecil's band. And I remember people being really perplexed by Naked City. Yes, indeed. I, my favorite memory is that we took a, a red eye flight to get to, uh, to Rio. And they kind of set it up so that there was a phalanx of press photographers waiting. Um, so when John and Cecil emerged at the same time as each other, looking fairly wretched because they hadn't slept and they were looking disheveled, and they walked out heading for the hotel to get some sleep. And the photographers took pic lots of pictures. And the next day, the headline in the local newspaper was a picture of Cecil and John. And it said, their music is as inelegant as their appearance. <laughs> <laughs> so there was kind of a setup. I think, I think, they, they, I think we were kind of set up to be the, the uh, the uh, Enfant Terrible of the festival. So we lived up to that. <laughs> well, it was it was neat because the festival included Max Roach's quartet, Horace Silver's quintet. Horace Silver was there, yeah, I remember. The, the Count Basie band. We all got mugged outside of our hotel. <laughs> yeah, I remember all of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's part of it that fascinated me. I'm very interested in the cultural impact of outsider music and the, the fact that um, when I got to Brazil that summer, I noticed they were dealing with cassettes. They were 10 years behind in terms of distribution of music. I mean, it's 89, it's pre-internet. Mm -hmm. And I brought a cassette, I know I gave a cassette of Derek Bailey solo to some journalists who had never heard him before. And I know that after the first gig, people were like really upset. But when we did the second gig, people started dancing. <laughs> and that it was like they had, they had finally sort of figured out what the vibe or what the pulse or what the energy was. It can also be um, a question of who gets to get the information first? I mean, I've, I've experienced this in the past where um, the jazz festival attracts a certain audience, for example, let's say in, in Rio, and therefore the audience kind of know what they're going to get, and it's much more traditional, and they go there. And then the first exposure leads people to understand that something else has happened. And then all the other people who were in the, you know, didn't know about it are going to come the next time. So there's there's a fan base which is not necessarily there at the beginning, but as soon as they hear about it, they show up. So it's not necessarily that the same people are being converted so much as the other people are saying, oh, it's something interesting, let's go. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a compl complicated mixture, but I've experienced that enough times over the years to know that that's something to do with it. Oh, that's interesting. Had you been to Brazil before? At that point, no, I've been there since, but uh, um, that was the first time I'd been to Brazil. And, and when did you go subsequently? Um, the last time was two years ago. I went with my trio and a special guest, Susana Santos Silva, playing trumpet. 
and uh, my better half Heike doing live visuals. And uh, we played in Rio and Sao Paulo. No, we didn't play in Rio. We played in Sao Paulo and um, Ararat. Can't remember the pronunciation. Can't remember the name. Anyway, a, a city. It's all part of a, a big festival, um, and it was. We did, I think, three or four concerts, and it was great. Um, very appreciative, large audience for this kind of music. So, you know, things have developed in the meantime. Well, it's about thirty years later. Right. I mean, what was more typical would be that I would get an, an invitation, and they say, "Could you come and play?" And I would say, "Yes," and then. It would turn out that they didn't have any money and couldn't pay my airfare to get there, and, and I'm not going to front my own airfare. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in that, that position, so it always, almost always, fell through. But this time it didn't, and we had a really good time. Yeah, it's it's interesting how people respond to the music. What, how did it uh, feel to you this time? It felt. You know, I think that uh, so much has happened in the meantime, and um, I think that there's now a much more solid audience for this kind of music than there was before. And, and uh, Brazil has such a strong musical identity. It has a very strong musical history, and it's its own thing, and it's, uh, you know, all power to it. But um, I think for that reason, it's almost like the UK for me. It's like getting people to listen to my stuff in the UK when there's so much music coming out of there was always difficult. And it's in Brazil, you know, when you've got Tom Zay and all of these incredible artists, it's like, they're not necessarily gonna go overboard with somebody they've never heard of from somewhere else. They need, they need encouragement. Right. And exposure, so. Hmm. You know, uh... I'm very interested in this period where you're at Cambridge and it's the 60s and I I always am interested in that era of how it forms a, a creative or a progressive thinking musician. Were you listening to the, the psychedelic stuff of, of the radio at that time? I would occasionally listen to John Peel's late night show on the radio because he was playing a completely eclectic, you know, it wasn't at all about pop music. It was like everything you could hear, all different kinds of ethnic music and jazz. And it was the most experimental radio of the time by far. And later when he had his, you know, the top gear, the more renowned show, it was in a way much more mainstream than when he was doing the perfume go. And uh, so I listened to the, I listened to the early radio show a lot. Um, but yeah, there's, it's, it's interesting. I've just been writing a piece about Ava Mendoza, who's a guitar player from California, who's playing at a festival. And they said, would I write something about her for the program? And I was talking to her about her um, beginnings. And it was clear that for her, the internet, the, the moment when she was at high school and getting interested in music, the internet was an incredible resource because you could actually access for free vast amounts of music. And so she could check things out and learn them. Um, and for me, the equivalent was the fact that in this late 60s, the record companies were putting things out without having any sense of the commercial viability of it. It was just like there was a new, relatively well-off young generation of people who were hungry for music and they were just sticking stuff out to see what would happen so it was before the kind of commercial restraints that were put on record companies within five or ten years it had completely narrowed and there were you know demographics and audiences you were aiming for and all of that but for this brief moment it seemed like record companies didn't have that sense of demographic identity and they were putting out everything the fact that AMM came out on the same label as The Doors, um, you know, without any uh, surprise. It was just, this is, this is what's going on now. And, and the same label also as the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, and I was a diehard blues fan. So I bought the Butterfield Blues Band and The Doors, and I thought well, the next record that came out on the Electra was AMM, so I got that too. You know, this is how musical taste is formed in this strange, random, <laughs> random way. 
buying stuff to see what it would be like. You could get an LP with the music of John Cage and Mimiroglu and um, for five bob at a, at a supermarket, you know. And I would just buy it because I had a university book allowance. I didn't ever buy books. I always bought records. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how I got into it. Was the contemporary classical avant-garde of interest to you at that time? What do you mean by that? I well, mean, Stockhausen, Cage, Feldman. Yeah, I mean, I had a, our friend Andy Powell, who was a music student at King's College, um, who had met Stockhausen and was very gung-ho and Cornelius Cardio and all this stuff. He introduced me to all of that music. I saw Earl Brown lecture at, uh, I went, I snuck into a music lecture. I wasn't studying music, but uh, I would get whatever I could while I was there. So I saw, I was exposed to a lot of contemporary music. Yes, um, between 67 and 70, all kinds of stuff going on. This poster behind me here, which probably comes out backwards where you are, right? No, it's good. Oh, it's forward, okay. Natural um, music, yeah. Um, yeah, um, that was a concert that had John Lennon, Yoko Ono, John McLaughlin, um, Barr Phillips. Uh, John McLaughlin didn't show up, but the others did. And uh, that was a concert I went to see in Cambridge. In fact, my landlady was selling the tickets at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was my life. <laughs> wow. So what was that concert about? It was... Um, a guy called Anthony Barnett, who was trying to make interesting things happen, and he'd invited the kind of cream of the British improvisation scene and others. Um, and Yoko Ono, who came with John. And um, I remember it chiefly because they st John and Yoko started the concert, and John was sitting cross-legged with his guitar leaning up against his amp, just feeding back. So there was just feedback from me, and she was screaming. And of course, the audience had never heard anything like that before, and it was very polarizing. And at the same time, I have a feeling that the musicians who were also on the same bill were finding this disconcerting as well. And eventually, before they finished, you had the spectacle of John Stevens and Barr Phillips and John Chikai and a couple of other people kind of ambling onto the stage and starting to play. And it could have been construed as an act of aggression. In other words, it's our turn now, please stop. <laughs> and I was backstage um, hearing John and Yoko, who were very upset that that had happened. Uh -huh. Although in the intervening years, the narrative has changed. So now everything is beautiful and it was a great happening and all of those things. But at the time it was tense. And so that was interesting. What year is that, Fred? 69, I think. Doesn't say on that. Yeah, it must have been 69. 69 is interesting, though, because I was always wondering if you had heard Trout Mask Replica when it came out. Absolutely. <laughs> you bet. I heard, first of all, Safe as Milk and got totally into beef art. And when um, Trout Mask came out, I was ready. And, and it remains an iconic record for me very, very strong influence on me. And we toured with him. So, you know, I got to know Don quite well on, on the tour. Could you talk a little bit about that? That's very interesting. Well, uh, you know, we had this uh, record label, Virgin and Henry Cow. We, we just made our second record. Lindsay Cooper had just joined the band and Virgin had signed Captain Beefheart. And they were going to do a promotional tour to promote the new record, which was pretty dreadful <laughs> because he, you know, he'd fired the magic band right beforehand and got hooked up with a bunch of LA session players. The tragic band. The tragic band, some of whom I have to say were great musicians and interesting people to hang out with, but the whole ethos was completely not right. And Beefheart would come off stage saying things like, that was the worst shit I ever played in my life, and they loved it. <laughs> He was, he was in a state of turmoil, you could say. And so we ended up hanging out with him a lot more than his band did. So we, we, we spent, it was a 30 day tour in a bus. <laughs> um, and yeah, 
it was interesting to watch night after night and get a feeling for what it could have been and wasn't. And it was also interesting to get a sense of um, his creative process because he was he carried a dictaphone with him and he was always talking into it. So we'd be on the bus and he would be pushing ideas into his uh, into his dictaphone all the time, constantly thinking about and working on stuff. Did he whistle into it? I never heard that. <laughs> Why you heard him whistle? Well, because he's he's a virtuoso. He was a virtuoso whistler. I, I had Zoot Horn Rollo on this program because I, I recorded a record with Zoot 20 years ago, his first and only solo record. And, um, and you know, we remain friends. So from time to time, I'll, I'll just sort of uh, query him about certain things. Is it true that you guys did everything and he did nothing? And, and, and what came out was the way that he would communicate ideas would be not only verbal, but he could whistle or sing lines. Yeah. And so it, it, it did become interesting to note that the piano playing wasn't the only way that, you know, they were getting their ideas, that it was actually coming from his whistling, which was, you know, at pitch and, and really focused. Right. So did you have conversations with him? Oh, yeah. No, we stayed in touch after the tour, too. So uh, I would uh, later I saw we, we did a double bill in Paris when he had a much better band back again. And also watching I got to know John French quite well because I made a couple of records with him and, and also um, hung with him. So I got lots of stories from John. <laughs> and uh, the, the band that played in Paris was phenomenally good. That was a really fantastic concert. So. It was nice to see him. I think the last time I saw him was he played in New York and we, we hung out briefly before before the concert. That must have been in the 80s. But then he got MS, so then it all kind of went haywire. Where, where is, was he drawing and uh, doing pencil stuff while you guys were on the road? Not that I was aware of, but um, I, you know, obviously I knew he painted. And what was interesting to me was um, when he... Uh, finally got an agent to look after his artistic work. And the agent basically said, I'll, I'll represent you, but only on condition that you give up music. And he did. And he said that he made more money from his artwork in the first year of doing it than he'd made in his entire music career up to that point, <laughs> which is kind of sad fact. Yeah. And I, I saw the paintings hanging in high-end galleries in New York while he was still alive. Uh -huh. Well, I have the book. He made a little booklet with the uh, paintings and the texts, which is very nice. It's like a little pink booklet? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So did you talk to him about being in a position to make rock music that would be outside of the normal? Like, was he was he seething with this idea of, I'm not going to go back to to doing the normal blues stuff? I would never have a conversation of that kind. And I don't think he'd have been that interested to have a conversation of that kind. I think he was, he was locked into his own creative process and didn't really look at it from the outside in that way at all. I don't think he was, uh, he was thinking about, well, I don't know. I didn't know him well enough to say, so maybe I should just shut up about it. <laughs> but I didn't get the impression that, that he was a calculating person in this way. He wasn't thinking about going back or going forward. He was busy being in the present. Were you, when you met Tim Hodgkinson at, at Cambridge, were you listening to the improv scene? Was, what was the improv scene in England at that time that you, you mentioned? Because I'm curious when you become aware of Derek Bailey and the work that he's doing with Music Improvisation Company, uh, Spontaneous Music Ensemble, AMN, you mentioned. What is that scene like when you're there? Well, we're not in London, so we're at Cambridge. And uh, the music business is extremely London-centric in probably still is, but definitely then. In order to have a career in music, you more or less have to move to London. And 
Obviously, things like the Beatles had changed that in the pop world to a certain degree. So you get the Manchester scene and the Liverpool scene and things like that. But if you're a jazz player or a new music player, then you pretty much needed to be in London in order for people to know that you existed, because that's where all the journalists were and all the gigs and all of that. Yeah. So the fact that we're in Cambridge means that we are very limited to what happens to be coming through, like natural music or Ustad um, Vilayat Khan or B.B. King, or, you know, I can name the people that I saw in Cambridge at the time, but there certainly wasn't, I wasn't aware of any of the improvisers then. In fact, my first experience of free improvisation was playing with t Tim. And it was the force of revelation that felt like we just invented something, which is very funny in retrospect, but, you know, we, we did a dance performance with me playing violin and him playing sax, and it was uh, very intense. And, you know, we'd never played together before, we'd hardly even met before, and we, we did this extraordinary music performance. And afterwards, it was like, wow, what just happened? You know, that was really interesting. And we absolutely wanted to play some more, and that's, that was the roots of Henry Cow. So the roots of Henry Cow were in this kind of completely new kind of improvisation, new to us, <laughs> because... We were obviously rather naive. Um, I had no idea about what was happening in London or what was happening in Sheffield and all of that. And it was when we um, we did a double bill with Kevin Ayers whole, and the Whole World, which was a very interesting band, which had Lowell Coxill and David Bedford, great composer, very interesting composer, and Mike Oldfield in it. And so on. quite an odd mixture of personalities uh, to be in a pop band. And I hung out with Lowell and Lowell heard me play and said, oh, you should check out Derek Bailey. And I said, who's that? And he said, if you go to the little theater club on next Sunday, he's playing a solo concert. So I thought, okay, I just moved to London um, by force. <laughs> I didn't want to go, but I went. And uh, I had nothing better to do, so I went to a little theatre club to see Derek. And um, as it turned out, I was the only person in the audience. Really? Yep. So he played the concert, and then we went home for tea. <laughs> wow. And we became good friends. We, you know, he would, I would, he became a kind of a mentor for me because I was also coming to London from Yorkshire, and he's a Yorkshireman, and. Um, I was a kind of a fake Yorkshireman, but I'd been brought up there, um, having Southern parents, but grew up in Yorkshire. Anyway, he was super supportive, and he often came to see Henry Cow play, brought his son along to check us out, and he would always say, well, you should be doing more improvising. And <laughs> um, but he was, yeah, he was, after this concert where I was the only person there, we, we became quite close and remained so. So I played in company weeks quite a few times in different locations and up, up to and including the, the one in Tennessee in Chattanooga where he was sick and couldn't come. So we ended up doing a company week without him with Tony Oxley and John and others. Yeah, I, I don't know if you, if you know any of the recordings I made with Derek, I've, I've done a, a few and I had an incredible experience with him because he was the first guy that I really played with in 83 when he was living in New York for a while. Do you remember? I remember. I, I played in company week in New York. It must have been a break about then. Yeah. Which I saw. Was that the one at Roulette? And it was also Laswell was on that. I'm trying to remember. Laswell, Brotsman, Joel Leandra, Keshavan Maslach. I can't remember who else, probably George, who was in most things. Yeah. Now, Derek was really cool because he was playing that in, in the basement at that place called The Saint. Oh, yeah. And it was uh, Derek, George, and, and Zorn. And I went up to him afterwards. I, I was a fan. I was in my second year of college. And I said, I, I'm a big fan. I'd really love to play with you. And he said, how's tomorrow? <laughs> He said, get me an amp, pick me up, and take me to your place, and we'll play. And I was in New Jersey, and I would go to the Lower East Side, pick him up, and we'd drive out to New Jersey. We played and recorded, and then I'd drive him back, and, and we did that several times. I still have the tapes. 
but yeah, he he um, he's the reason I got the Cecil gig. Oh yeah, Didn't know because that. Cecil was going. Do you remember when Cecil went to to Germany to play with all the uh, FMP guys, etc.? Yeah, yeah. And see, Cecil and I were hanging out, and he had never heard Derek. Oh, okay. So he said, I'm supposed to play a duet concert with this guy, Derek Bailey. Do you know anything about him? I said, yeah, I, you know, I play with him. Do you want to hear a recording? And I, I played him this recording. He really liked it. And about a year later, I got called for Cecil's band. But Cecil and Derek, have, have you ever heard that recording? No, it I've really heard just Cecil and Tony, but I haven't heard Cecil and Derek. Yeah, Cecil and Derek. The first time, it just is two guys having two separate, you know, discussions. Um, Derek wouldn't tune to the piano, of <laughs> course. So there's that. <laughs> That's one of my favorite Derek things too. Is I I said to him one time, "Do you want to tune to my vibraphone, Derek?" And he said. Well, no, we don't want it to sound like Christmas bells. <laughs> yeah. Um, w were you aware of Music Improvisation Company when that was happening with you, Davies, and Evan, and those guys? No. no I, I became aware of Derek because I was sent there by LOL. And then I, you know, got to know Derek, but I never went to the Little Theatre Company ever again. I didn't see any of the other people who were playing there. I didn't have any connection with any of that stuff. The next, um, the next step for me in that world was hearing the first solo record of Bar Phillips, which was produced by John Sermon and um, recorded in a church, incredible acoustic. And I thought, this is, this is what I want to do. When I heard Bar Phillips, it really, um, that got me seriously interested in what I could make the guitar do, how I could transform the guitar into some kind of an orchestra, how I could you know, change the vocabulary of the instrument. So more than listening to another guitar player like Derek, who was inspiring because Derek is inspiring in himself, but the music was not necessarily the kind of thing I aspired to do. But Bar Phillips, that felt like much more like home to me. So that was kind of a starting point. And I heard that- 71 also, so must have heard it around the same time as I first first heard Derek. When you did your first uh, guitar solo record in 74, I think it was. Yeah. Um, was all of that live in real time? Yeah. Do you remember any of the setups? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was basically I had a a guitar that was, um, I had a pickup mounted over the end of the nut, which is, I'm still using. I mean, same guitar, same pickup. <laughs> um, but um, effectively, it was a stereo guitar, so I had uh, three separate sound sources, one from a nut pickup and one from each of the other pickups. And I was able, by using a capo on the 12th fret, to actually have two separate bits of the guitar, one for each hand, and going through a separate pedal array, meaning in those days, volume pedals and distortion, and that was about it. But um, the basic setup was that. It's funny to me because everybody now says, oh, um, I was influenced by Keith Rowe and all of the record is made with the guitar flying flat. Completely untrue. <laughs> Only one track on the whole record has got guitars laid flat, and that was by accident, not because I'd ever seen Keith play, because I hadn't. I didn't see Keith play until the 80s, actually. Wow. Except um, he came and opened for Henry Cow when we did a series called The Explorers Club at the London School of Economics. And it was with, we'd invited Cornelius Cardew and they came and did um, revolutionary songs. So they didn't do any improvising at all. and. You know, they're not, they weren't very good at it. They were, it was very morally righteous and they were doing something they strongly believed in, but musically it was really not good. So that was my only experience of seeing Keith. Hmm. Until I saw, you know, was on a bill with him improvising together in the 80s that um, somebody else promoted. So, so the, uh, the whole, what you read online about 
my mentorship of Keith, um, Keith mentorship of me is exactly not true. I knew Keith as the guy who did those horrible revolutionary songs and who came to see Henry Cow to try and convert us to the Workers' Revolutionary Party about once a month. Well, is that because you were coming across as being sympathetic to that cause with your work? Oh, yeah, we were diehard leftists, absolutely. Yeah. And there was only one righteous path, which was the, the Maoist path, which was the one he was on. So he, he would come and try and enlist us because we had a big audience and that would have meant, you know, like all the uh, all the politicians, they're very anxious. It doesn't matter what party you're in, to enlist some popular music in order to make yourself look hip. So it hasn't changed today. Look at Trump. <laughs> no, it hasn't changed. Um, Fred, was was Henry Cow, to your way of thinking, part of the Canterbury scene, the so-called Canterbury scene? Um. I always thought of the Canterbury scene as being a, a weird construct that had nothing to do with us. In fact, I'm not even sure I've ever even been to Canterbury. Maybe, maybe, maybe we did one gig there, but I don't think so. Anyway, um, no, I don't. It doesn't have any resonance for me particularly. Did any of those bands interest you? Huh? Any of those bands interest you? Ooh, are we talking what? Caravan and Soft Machine and... Egg? Egg. Well, you know, Soft Machine were very influential on me when I was young. I was a big fan of Robert Wyatt. I tried to get into the Soft Machine when I was a student. Somebody, uh, I was became friendly with Ian McDonald, or McCormick as he then was, um, became a very important journalist later, but we were students together and he happened to live next door to Robert in London. So he said, oh, I've got his phone number. So I called him up and said, hey, I noticed that you don't have a guitar player in Soft Machine, and I think I'm the person who you should have. And, and of course, he said, great, come on, come and play. And I immediately um, was terrified and backed off. I mean, I was 18, you know. <laughs> 18 and grew up in the countryside, and I suddenly lost my nerve when it came down to it. Things could have been very different had it gone differently, but I'm happy with the way things worked out. And Robert and I became, of course, friends, so. He's so great. But yeah, I mean, the Canterbury scene, that there were aspects of it that I liked and aspects of it that I found a bit bland. Um, great musicians, I mean, Egg were obviously great musicians, but I wasn't a big fan of the music. I saw them play many times. Did you? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't imagine that they had much of a, a large audience at that time. None of us did. <laughs> did you said did Henry Cow have have a good concert following? Outside of Britain, yeah. No, we, at, in our, at our peak period, um, when we were very pretty much always touring in Italy and France in particular, but also Scandinavia a little bit everywhere in Europe, in fact, but um, Italy and France was where our biggest audiences were. And we had, we had crowds and numbering in the thousands, you know, not stadium, but <laughs> a big committed audience. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me because while people might lump Henry Cow in with that scene, I always felt that you guys were more wild and more, open to a sort of all different approaches to the music. Yeah, I think, I think conceptually we were on a very different level than any of those other bands who were very busy doing the thing that you do if you're in a rock band and trying to sell yourself with a certain identity. And uh, you're encouraged to do that by your record label if you have one. And so they're all of them very strong identity within a particular um, uh, cadre of, of uh, musical thought. And I think our idea was that we would never submit ourselves to that. <laughs> so um, from Virgin's point of view, we were impossible because we were not staying still for a minute. We were not allowing them to be able to market us in this way or that way because we might end up coming up to a concert and playing only improvised music for a whole concert instead of doing our written material. We would 
constant, no concert was ever the same. We were constantly adjusting the material. We would deconstruct pieces that we'd written and move the bits around and put other things in between them. So it was a, it was a very fluid collective work process, which is why it was so difficult and also why it was successful. Was Electric Miles of interest? Sure. Yeah. No, I, uh, in a silent way, and Bitches Brew were, were on the turntable quite a bit when they came out. Um, I was less interested in the textural aspects and more interested in the way that the soloing could be over that kind of texture. So, I mean, the thing about Miles is always about sound and timing. And um, from that point of view, I regard him as being a huge influence on me. Um, just understanding when to do something and when not to do something and uh, understanding the nuances of the sound, having a, a beginning and a middle and an end and how that works. Um, I found that enormously um, inspiring. Um, and I got to meet him, which was of course wonderful. How did that happen? We were on our way to the Montreux Festival. I was going to join Naked City and I was working in, um, I was working in Marseille at the time, working with um, young unemployed rockers from the ghettos as the government loved to describe them. And um, I had a gig with Naked City. And so I was taking a plane from Marseille airport to um, Geneva and Miles had been playing at Nice the day before, and so he was on, on the same flight with his band, and it was a rather small, like a mini compute, commuter jet with his band, and they had so many instruments. Like when I walked out to get on the plane, there were people trying to cram stuff into the hole and it wasn't fitting, so they ended up having all the band members had their instrument on their lap in the plane, which was completely illegal, but we did it anyway. And then... Um, when we got off the plane, I found myself standing with Miles, just the two of us waiting for our driver to come pick us up. So that was, uh, you know, I was desperately shy, but it was a moment that I will treasure. <laughs> yeah. How did you guys get along with Virgin then? I mean, that must have been fraught. Not really. Um, I think, you know, at the beginning, Richard Branson, entrusted the label to his um the people who've been running the mail order store simon draper in particular the south african connection and they were extremely broad-minded musically and were idealistic they wanted to make something happen with the kind of music that they loved and we were part of that um but the uh, economic imperatives were such that it was not ever likely to work um you know and i think once Branson understood that things changed and that in fact the whole label was kept afloat by tubular bells which nobody expected would become a hit but suddenly it sold six million copies and that kind of gave them their, their economics to be able to keep going for quite a while with the rest of us until it became clear that actually this was a this was not going to happen so they were completely behind us for the first record and they were kind of behind us for the second record and then they, the merger with Slap Happy happened and they were excited about that. And the first one came out and that was very behind us. And then when In Praise of Learning came out, then they thought, okay, <laughs> that, that, that's it. That's it. Um, you mentioned Tubular Bells and I have, uh, have seen the 1973 video of the live performance of Tubular Bells with you and a cadre of other luminaries from that time period in that place. Do you have any recollection of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, we'd, we'd hung out with Mike Oldfield a bit. He was the assistant engineer on Henry Cow's first record. Um, notoriously, he erased the whole mix that we did. <laughs> we, the first side of Leg, Leg End, we finally had it in the can and edited and everything and on the two track and we needed to make a master copy. And this was entrusted to Mike as the second engineer while we went to dinner. So you have the machine with the master on it and the machine, which is the blank tape. So then he probably slightly drunk because he was a heavy drinker. 
he probably um, he pressed the record on the master tape <laughs> and not on the blank tape. So we ended up with two blank tapes after two weeks of work. <laughs> so then we had to do it all over again. So we knew my <laughs> we knew my quite well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, and I'd seen him play in whole, you know, Kevin Ayers' whole world. So you know, we 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 knew each other, and uh, he, incredible musician, unbelievable. Um, loved his playing, and um, he actually, uh, when it came to doing Tubular Bells live, he even asked me if I would be the music director because he was shy and didn't want to be the director. And I, I said, no, <laughs> I was not ready to be Mike Oldfield. It was hard enough just trying to be me. So um, he ended up being his own music director. And I remember the rehearsals were very intense. Um, and Mick Taylor turning up in a limo every night <laughs> <laughs> to the rehearsal and back again. And Mick Jagger and Keith Richards showing up in the dressing room after the after the concert. <laughs> Which is an indicator, I guess, of just how big that record was, huh? Yeah, and I th well, it's, it's complicated. As it turns out, I think Mike's sister had worked with Mick Jagger on a record production, and um, uh, Mick Taylor was in the Rolling Stones at the time, so, you know, and he was in the band. So there were connections between them, so. Mm. But yeah, it was, it was an in interesting combination of people, Steve Hillage, Mick Taylor, you know, Mike Ratledge. Yeah. And, and, and Oldfield playing bass quite uh, ferociously on it too. Yeah, and guitar. Um, I think I, I played bass on it as well. Yeah. We were constantly shifting around. But yeah, Mike's bass playing is phenomenal. I mean, he's an extraordinary, extraordinary musician, very difficult person. But. You mentioned the collaboration with Slap Happy. Uh -huh. How did that come about? And, and what did you see as being the real, the strengths of it, the real, the real benefit of it? Oh, well, um, they were uh, very interesting folks, first of all. I mean, they were a great hang. <laughs> So when we met them and just, you know, we're, we're hanging out with them, they, it was kind of seductive. I mean, Peter's an extraordinary character and the, the stories they were telling and then the most vocal talent. And it's like, you know, what's not to love? And they did beautiful records and we really liked the records. And then we thought this could be really interesting to what happens if we bring in something much more like a song aspect into our work, which we didn't have, and, except for me. You know, I'd, I'd written quite a few songs in the early days of Henry Cow, but I kind of talked myself out of it. So I just didn't think I was very good. And the idea of having a phenomenal singer at our disposal in that kind of, and, and to be able to do songs, I was super excited about it. So, yeah, it was not to be, it was a kind of a fiasco, but. But it's something you came back to more than once, right? What, what did we come back to? The collaboration between... Well, we, did, we did the Desperate Straits record, which was basically their record, which we played on. So um, it became collaborative in as much as some of the songs. I mean, I remember working on Strayed with Peter Blegvad together, and that was very much, you know, what came out was a result of, of the work we did together on it. So it felt promising. It felt like we could work together. We could produce stuff. And those are, I think... John and Peter in particular worked extremely well together, which, you know, led to other things later. But um, after that, then the, it became the thing of them working on our record. Right. And that was an absolute disaster. <laughs> I, I read that you were very unhappy with it. I was. Yeah. I was, yeah, I mean, there were things about the record I liked. There were things about the technology that I didn't like. We were using a new DBX um, noise reduction system, which allowed an almost infinite number of uh, noise-free overdubbing. So we could bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce. And of course that may sound exciting, but in fact, it's a, it's a rabbit hole. And the sound of that record, I really don't like. <laughs> 
it's very, very um, brittle and cold to me, which in, in the light of the, some of the material, which is definitely not brittle and cold, uh, I felt like it, it, we could have done it much better with, a, with hindsight, wonderful hindsight. Um, and I think I was not in very good shape mentally at the time anyway, so I was kind of slightly disengaged from it in a way that I regret. But you went on to, to form the Art Bears with Dagmar and Chris Cutler. It was kind of forced upon us in a way. I mean, I'm not complaining, it was a wonderful thing, but um, you know, the, the, we were doing another Henry Cow record and, the, and their record was gonna be our last because, uh, well, no, we didn't, did we know that? No, we didn't know that then. We, we did it, we were doing our next record. And um, we had planned to record a big piece of Tim's which we were disagreeing about the words. And Whose we had words? Tim's words. Um, there was, you know, the usual to and fro discussing. We discussed everything at great length. <laughs> and um, we had already re Dagmar had meanwhile left Henry Cow, but we had rehired her to sing this piece. And so we had the studio time booked. And then at the last minute, it kind of broke down and and we decided we weren't ready to record Tim's piece yet. It was a very difficult, very long piece, which, uh, you know, we figured we'd do it later. Um, but then we had the studio booked and Dagmar coming. So somebody had the idea of maybe we should do a record of songs. Why not? So let's write some. <laughs> and it's, you know, the classic situation, which I relish um, which, and I'm good at, which is giving me a deadline and say, you've got to finish this now. And so I wrote a shitload of stuff. Um, and we ended up recording it. Without, this was a Henry Cow record. We had no sense, I mean, of what was going to happen, but um, because I'd written a lot of the material, not all of it, you know, so there were some other things. Tim had written a beautiful song on it. A song I wish I'd written. <laughs> um, Which song is that? I think it's called the pirate song. Is that right? Beautiful melody. Anyway, yeah, we recorded it and it was a very intense process. And because Chris and I had been largely in, into the idea and, and the inspiration of it, and we, we were in the studio all the time working on it. And I think the atmosphere became a bit, you know, whose record is this and what's going on? And it was awkward. And then we finished the record and, um, went home to listen to it in the cold light of day and half the group said this is we don't want to release this we don't think this is a henry cow record uh. and this led to two things one it led to chris and dagmar and i saying well why don't we release that as a separate side project and we'll do another henry cow record which is what actually happened we did Art Bears became the side project, and the next record was Western Culture, which had Lindsay and Tim's compositions on it. But of course, the other side effect was that we started saying, well, you know, if we can't agree about the quality of this work, which we love and you don't, why are we in a band together? <laughs> and so that crack led to the group breaking up. And we broke up, but we had six months worth of tours booked. <laughs> Most logical, normal human beings would say, well, screw the tours, <laughs> we're breaking up, goodbye. But we said, no, we wouldn't do that to our fans, so we're going to do the gigs anyway. So we went out on the road for six months, um, knowing that we were going to break up at the end of that six months and working with new material. <laughs> um, <I love> this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, slightly bonkers. Um, and... It was a very fraught period with all kinds of problems. And um, at the same time, when the music was working, it was working better than ever. So when we came to the end of the group, which was, I think we played in Milan in August of 78. Um, huge crowd. Um, and it felt great. And after that, it was over. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Very strange. We went straight, I think we went straight from there to the studio and recorded 
Western culture and then broke up after that. I think that's the sequence. I don't really, I can't remember mm. if that's the right sequence. But yeah, it was kind of a crazy year in 1978 altogether. Between art bears and then Western culture and then the group breaking up and then me getting a call from Giorgio Gomelsky saying, you should come to New York. Here's a ticket. <laughs> he sent me a ticket and said, come on, don't bring your guitar. You don't need a guitar. Just come in and see what's going on. You should be here. So I went. Hmm. And uh, that was the beginning of the next chapter. Yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting juncture because you coming to the New York scene, you're going to immerse yourself in all these other projects, sort of have your druthers, whatever you want to do now, because you're not really in a band. But I'm also understanding that that's simultaneous with the Art Bears first few things, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The first record we made was in 78. And then we made another one in, I guess, um, 79 and another one in 81. And I moved to New York in eighty in seventy eight. So um, it's straight. I mean, the period from seventy eight to eighty three, I would say, was one of the most creatively explosive periods of my life. I mean, you know, massacres in there, materials in there, um, the three Art Bears records are in there. Gravity, Speechless, Cheap at Half the Price are in there. I mean, it's, you know, Aksak Mabul is in there. There's so much shit going on. Me and Henry Kaiser's projects. Um, crazy, crazy times. You know, I was really strongly affected by the Art Bears at that time. I was in high school. Uh -huh. And I had never been confronted with such aggressive socialism in the music and also such a bleak worldview. You're talking about the world as it is today. Well, it's, it's the 40th anniversary this year of the world as it is today. Uh -huh. And <laughs> that record really knocked me over uh, truth and uh, investment capital and, and those pieces I, I would say kind of politically realigned me to, I, I, I grew up in a Democrat household and, and we we're very, uh, very left. But I think just the idea that um, I'd never seen a band intelligently address those issues. I mean, it's interesting too, because that's sort of simultaneous with, uh, you know, punk tearing everything down, et cetera but you guys were coming from more of an intellectual stance on it. Is that fair? Yeah, I'd say that's fair, yeah. I mean, you know, the process was Chris would provide lyrics, so I had nothing to do with the lyrics. Um, he would just say, okay, here, here's the words I'm working with, and I would take them away and write the music. But they were inspiring to you. You, you, you well, liked those words. Mostly, and it was also very... Um, inspiring and tight so i mean the world as it is today was literally entirely written in 48 hours basically i finished recording speechless i'd been in the studio in france and then in switzerland i'd spent a month recording speechless and mixing it and i was going to stay in the studio and go straight into the next art bears record and I had two days and I got, the, I got the lyrics the day after we finished Speechless and I sat down at a piano and wrote all of the songs and then we started work. Uh, so it was a product of an extremely um, intense 48 hour period where I just sat in front of the piano and did it. And so I was having a very intuitive response to the lyrics and my ideas about what to do with them and what music there are musical references which are kind of hidden in there which i can hear and i'm not sure if anybody else can you know like what um out of town that one um that has got the chord sequence from el pueblo unido jamás será vencido inside it um little things like that Ref references Revolutionary music references, for example. And, um, you know, I was having fun. It's like the whole, the truth thing where you do these big cinema organ chords under the, 
which completely break up the, the rhythm. I mean, just stuff like that. It was super fun to do. I always felt like the, um, the truth vocal and the chord was like a kind of graffiti uh -huh. over the music. And it seemed to be like something that you're interested in. I've seen layering as part of your interests over the years too. Well, I, I like to, to let the words, the rhythm of the words dictate in a way how the music sounds rather than force the words into a rhythmic framework that I'm putting onto it. I let the words be the rhythmic framework and then I have to adjust the rhythmic framework to the rhythm of the words. And that was an extreme example of that to me. But we, back in the, back in the Canterbury days, <laughs> um, Dave Stewart from Egg and Hatfield in the North and all of that, he used, to, he used to have a thing he would do where he would play these horrible cinema chords. Um, and I remembered this and I was, in a way, that's my little homage to Dave Stewart. <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. You know, um, another friend of, of Dave Stewart, Andy Partridge from XTC, uh -huh. was on this program recently, and he asked that I tell you that Winter Songs is one of his favorite records of all time. Wow. Thank you <laughs> for passing that along. And and it's, it's a very intense record. Uh, I just have to say the combination of Chris's lyrics and Dagmar's voice could be one of the greatest collaborations that I've heard in so-called, you know, song-based music. I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, there's the whole news from Babel as well uh, with Lindsay's music, which is also Chris and, Chris and Dagmar um, collaboration. So there's a, several records worth of that as well, equally striking. Um, yeah, the Winter Songs is also one of my favorites, I have to say. And it's interesting also because at that time I had been on our last tour um, of Henry Cow, we'd also been working with the Mike Westbrook Orchestra. We had a joint project and it included the British um, folk singer. Um, oh man, of course I haven't had completely forgotten her name. Armstrong, something. Nah, it's popped out of my head. Age is a terrible thing. Um, anyway, but she had she had introduced me to um, Bulgarian music. We used to sit in the dressing room, and she would have a little cassette player, and she was playing me um, those early recordings of Bulgarian choirs and stuff. And uh, I think Winter Songs is. Um, the outcome of my influence from that listening. So there's a lot of, a lot of Bulgarian influence in the vocal harmonies of that record, mm. for example. Yeah, you've, you've definitely explored a lot of folk influences in your work and, and even um, the, the through line of all the dance music that goes back to, to gravity and, and forward in terms of access to that music early on what were what were the sources going to concerts folkways what were, what were the, the the ways to get pre-internet world music well like i said before in the late 60s a lot of that stuff was coming out on the first for the first time so when i was a student in my late teens early 20s we were having access suddenly to um indonesian music balinese music um, japanese court music gagaku um, I went to see concerts of Indian classical music in Cambridge with an almost entirely Indian only audience, which was phenomenal because it wasn't yet what it became later. So going to see Ustad Vilayat Khan and being one of the only um, non-Indian members of the audience was quite an experience because it's completely there. It's like people are shouting and getting excited. And, you know, you, you hear the music in a different kind of way, very passionate. Um, so they had, I had all of that. Um, I had a school friend, Bojan Jovanovic, uh, who was, um, I guess he was Croatian, Yugoslavian then. But, um, he taught me lots of folk music from his 
area when I was 14, 15. So I learned things in 5, 8, 7, 8, 9, 8, um, going back to then and from a folk context rather than another one. So that was interesting also. So I had this, you know, different roots in different places. Um, and after all, my first performances were in folk clubs. So that's where I began. When I was 16, uh, on Saturday night, I would go down to the local folk club and sing a couple of songs, which is what you did. And what was great about it is that you were always accepted. There was never any hostility. You were always like, nice job, you know, have another beer, you know. It's like, it was very, it was a beautiful, um, affirming experience to do that every week in front of an audience who were just as capable of singing themselves as they were people getting up and singing for them. So that's where my performing life began in that folk context. Is, is that a uniquely Yorkshire experience? No, no. Um, back then in Britain, it was kind of the folk revival and every pub in every town had a folk club in the upstairs room. And, you know, there was a circuit so you could actually play to several different folk clubs if that's what you wanted to do. Uh, and working men's clubs or the other thing. Um, got a splinter, damn it. Yeah, you could, uh, working men's clubs were supposedly male only, but you could invite your spouse, I believe. And um, they were kind of ex places where working class people would go drink at the end of the day. And I played in a few of those also in those days, got together with friends and put together little bands and played folk songs. Mm. Did that influence your, your thinking about engaging with an audience? Uh, at, well, the yeah, working men's clubs, absolutely, because they were much more likely to be hostile. <laughs> the folk clubs were extremely welcoming and affirming, and the working men's clubs were like, yeah, what you got? Come on, show me. Yeah, it was much more in your face. So they were good experiences to have. And I was not the kind of player who would be trying to entertain people. I've never been very good at that. I'm just, I try to, I mean, I get intensely involved in the performance and that's enough for me. I'm not trying to make you feel good or make you laugh or any of those things. So that kind of uh, accepting myself for who I was, was part of this whole experience. You know, I'm not going to be an entertainer in that way. I wish I could be. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah, I wish I could sing. Yeah, don't you? Me too. <laughs> uh, but but you had you had the voice of Dagmar Kraus on that that Art Bears stuff, and I wanted to tell you a little experience I had. The last four years have been so brutal, you know. So I thought, as we're coming down to the to, to the election, I'm going to put on the world as it is today, and it's going to help me. It's going to help me cope. It's going to help me get some sort of perspective on this, this moment, you know? And it just made me crazy. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't finish listening to it, Fred. And the intensity of it, the brutal honesty of it, the in-your-face quality of it, still, I think, is one of the great achievements in, in popular music, if you want to call it that, or song form. How important was that record to you at that time? Because I feel like it's so supercharged with energy and, and anger and emotion. Am I far off? No, not at all. I mean, my memory of it is that it went by so quickly. I'm like I said, 48 hours to, to conceive it two weeks to record and mix it, and then it's gone. Wow. So basically a couple of weeks of my life and I was already doing another project right afterwards. I think I went straight from there to doing something else. So, you know, it was, it was uh, that's how it was then. It was just like, wow, just couldn't wait to get on to the next thing. So I didn't really even have time to digest it. I had plenty of time over the years to digest it, you know, and I'm, of course, I'm very proud of those three records. I think they're, you know, strong work. And um, we've been talking about doing another one. Is that right? Yeah. 
somebody said, isn't it time you did another one? Look at what's going on in the world. <laughs> I'd buy it. Yeah, I'd probably buy it too. That's two of us. How have you felt about the watching the politics over the last few years? Grim. I mean, you know, aside from cultural personality Trump, it's not as if he's responsible for all of this shit. The system is completely screwed. And, um, you know, there are very few politicians one could say one could trust on, in any party. It's like there is so much money coming from so many dubious sources that we don't even know about. Citizens United was such a bad decision and it's so much affected the political culture that, um, and the fact that now we're in a post-truth environment. So it's like, you can't trust it what you read, you can't trust what you listen to. Uh, and it's tribalized everything. Trump may have polarized that even further, but it was already in place. And I don't see that that's gonna change. So, you know, pol politics needs a complete reboot. Um, coming from an idea of people doing something for themselves um, from a position of um, honesty and moral righteousness of some description, but the moral righteousness in the way it's dressed up in this country is usually the opposite of what it says it is. <laughs> I look at all these countries where, you know, they have uh, interesting, decent politicians. I'm wondering why we couldn't do that here. I mean, you go to a place like Iceland or Uruguay or New Zealand, and it seems like, okay, these are decent people who are doing sensible things. <laughs> do we have decent people doing sensible things in American politics? <laughs> it's hard to imagine anyone that can get away with being decent. Or certainly, you know, uh, uh, make it a functional part of the political system, right? Uh -huh. They're so outnumbered. Yeah, there was a brief period um, when the Czech Republic, um, after 89, when Václav Havel became the prime minister. And this was a guy, you know, he was an artist. We knew him drinking with him. Suddenly I knew people in the Czech government, Eva Bitova. Um, and it was a very miraculous time when, you know, uh, suddenly you are talking to ordinary people who are in a position of power, who seem sensible and um, have the right ideas at the right time. Didn't last very long, but it was interesting to be around sort of indicating that it is possible. It ought to be, you'd think. But the basic human um, condition seems to me to be greed. So um, somehow that, most, that militates against anything. Everything's about greed. Religion's about greed. Politics is about greed. Who's gonna pay for me? Where am I gonna get the money from? How do I get to do these things that I want to do without anybody else finding out about it? And yeah. since humans are greedy, it doesn't matter what political system you're in. You could say that communism failed because of greed and capitalism is definitely failing because of greed and on and on. So you said you over the years had a chance to, to digest what was going on in the world as it is today recording. Any thoughts about it now, looking 40 years back? Nothing has changed. <laughs> what can I say? Out of town. My work takes me out of town. I empty villages. I burn their houses down. <laughs> yeah.
maybe we should dwell on on more positive things for a moment. Fred Frith, when you came to New York, there was so much going on. And I remember seeing you playing solo and I remember seeing you in, in Massacre and all these different things. Can you talk a little bit about Massacre? Because I'm curious about the, the first record, Killing Time, in 81. Am I to understand that those were literally improvised pieces or did they stem from improvs that things sort of got codified or nailed down a little bit? What's the process in Massacre? Um, it's about 50-50 from what you described. Um, the basic process was initially that I would provide some kind of a head. Um, so bones, legs, killing time, those things have got some kind of rhythmic structure and um, even melodic structure to a certain degree. And then I would throw that out there and Fred and Bill would deal with it. And um, Bill hates reading music, and, but he's got an incredible ear. So he was able to take the basic rhythmic ideas and extrapolate them and do it into something that he could do. So it became improvised, but based on that basic idea. That was that accounts for about fifty percent of what we were doing, and the other fifty percent we would just improvise. And that that was a typical performance. Was that you would be switching back and forth? Yeah, I mean, it got more and more improvised as we went along. So. Um, I think by the time we were playing in Europe, in Paris, I remember, I think it was probably 75% improvised by then. Um, still, certainly judging by the recordings. I mean, I've got recordings from them. That seems like that's what was going on. And, and why did you end up uh, changing drummers? Oh, it's much more complicated than that. <laughs> um, I went away to make Speechless in the world as it is today. And when I came back, um, while I had been gone, Material were working with Herbie Hancock huh, on Rocket. And somehow this collaboration between Material and Herbie Hancock had become a collaboration between Bill Laswell. So Bill had become nominally the producer and the other members of Material were not very happy about the fact that they had been basically preempted. So Material broke up. Mm. And that effectively meant that Bill, uh, Fred, who was a drummer in Material as well as in Massacre, was no longer going to work with Bill. So I had no drummer. And we did try a few things. We even, uh, you know, we had a session with Ronald Chan Jackson, which was interesting. Um, but it never came to anything. Hmm. Any um, tapes of that? Huh? Any tapes? I hope not. I had a very bad amp and very old strings and I was very unhappy. It was a, it was a spontaneous thing because he happened to be there where we were. And, yeah. Hmm. And we could have, it could have been interesting, but, um, I think it would have been impossible, um, for various reasons. But then Massacre disappeared. And then um, Bill and Charles Haywood and I were invited to work on a record by Percy Howard, a record Meridian, beautiful, incredible singer. And um, he flew us into New York, I think, New Jersey maybe, during Bill's studio. So we spent a week working on Percy's songs, and at the end of the day, we had, um, I think, three hours left before I had to go to the airport. And somebody said, why don't you make a, make a record? So we spent three hours just, uh, we would do a song, stop, do a song, stop, do a song. And what you hear on that record, that next Massacre record, is exactly what we did in exactly the order we did it. So that's, that's what you hear is what you got. Um, and then after we'd done that, then Zorn and, and Laswell said, well, you know, this sounds kind of like it's a massacre kind of a deal. And Charles and I were less convinced that that was the case. But eventually we said, all right, why not? 
So that became massacre. But that was quite a few years later, 10 years at least. I have a very fond memory of uh, in the early 80s, it, it could have been 82 or 83, and uh, you had formed Skeleton Crew with Tom Cora. Uh -huh. Tom is, is someone that I don't think is, is spoken about enough. I had the opportunity to, to, to play with him. And I have very fond memories also of, of getting together just to jam with him in his apartment. And uh, I still have those tapes somewhere. Down on Chambers Street. Yes. And two, two floors below Cecil. <laughs> Yeah, it was. He said to me that I'm in the same building as Cecil Taylor, and Cecil ended up in Brooklyn. But I remember when he was on Chambers Street. Um, but one of the formative concerts for me was Cargo Cult Revival, Tom Cora and David Moss. Yeah. Do you remember that record? Oh yeah. It's just been re-released. Oh good. Yeah. Is there more? more is there bonus stuff? I'm. Fairly sure not. Um, it was a record that I put out on Rift Records originally, and it's now on Clang Gallery, which is a really good label based in Vienna, which is doing a lot of re-releases of, of that period. So if you're sitting on tapes of archives, I'm sure he'd be interested to hear it. Okay. Yeah, I, I just thought that when I saw it in a duo situation, a cellist, prepared cello, extended techniques and a percussionist with all sorts and just you know a completely wild approach at roulette just at that time and i thought i want to do that <laughs> and you, you know and, and i and i did within a few years of that have those things going on but there was there was an approach that tom had that i found so exciting which was kind of events. I don't know if you, if you ever think of it, of these things that way, but in an improvised setting, events going from sort of texture to texture, discrete sections within improvising, but you're listening and you're, okay. you're still responding, but you kind of have this idea of, well, I'm moving to the next thing and I'm moving to that thing and I might refer back to another thing. Is that something that, that you found interesting about them, or what, what was what was your attraction to Tom? My attraction to Tom, well, you know how we met. <laughs> we were we were both invited to play in Zorn's Archery up in Columbia University, and I had just moved um, to New York, and so had Tom, and we we were both trying to get to the venue on the subway, and I found myself in Harlem. Um, having gotten on the wrong A train and I went up to the and asked somebody what the quickest way and I thought we could go across the park and he said no go go down don't go across the park go down so I went down back into the subway and there was a guy with a cello on the opposite platform and I'm thinking I've got my guitar he's got his cello maybe we're going to the same place so I say you, you guys Play with someone. He said, "Yeah." He said, "Which of us is right? <laughs> is your, your platform." I don't even remember who was right, but eventually we ended up going the same way, and that's how we met. Um, and then I heard him in a in a concert with Wayne Horvitz, and I thought that he would sound great in a rock band. And at that point, up until then, I'd only heard him in the improvising context. But then I understood that he had this other this other dimension that I found really interesting. So. Um, it, actually, Skeleton Crew started off as a quartet, so you know we were playing with Fred Meyer, the drummer, and Tim Schellenbaum, and uh, they had ish health issues, which meant we had to cancel a couple of concerts. And in the end, we just looked at each other and said, "Hey, let's just do it, just the two of us. Why not?" So that's how that happened. Um, but it's interesting what you say about events because I think that. There was a formal um, approach to improvising that was very much going on in the media around Zorn, and it was also to do with his um, game pieces that we were playing. So pieces like archery and lacrosse from that period, one of the things they do is define events. So you have lots of instructions in the score saying EV, um, 
And so there's an, you know, there's an instruction not to do linear stuff, but to do, you know, more pointed, pointillistic, event-oriented stuff. And I think that had a huge impact on the kinds of improvisation that people were doing. And I think that uh, there's a style of improvising that was in common with a lot of the people who I was playing with after I arrived in New York. I mean, Leslie Delaba and Zorn and Tom Cor, David Maltz, people we've talked about and many others, um, which was very quick based on the exchange of event information. Um, so you had to have very sharp hearing and, and good timing, um, but there was never any desire to develop a long uh, storyline. Didn't happen. It was all exchange kind of communication. And uh, yeah, you could learn how to do that. It, it misses certain things. I mean, there are other things that you can't do with that. So it's important to understand the difference. But I, I learned a lot from it, absolutely, um, about you know how to how to listen and how to respond and all of those important things. And Tom was great at that. Um, and in his later manifestation, when he started using a sampler, because one of the things he got from Skeleton Crew was he became very fluent with four limbed approach. So, um, which is his his designation. But he he had a sampler with um, foot pedal. Uh, triggers so he could record himself and trigger the recording with his feet and he could do it on several layers and so his later concerts he was doing a very fluent movement between feet and hands with different parts of his vocabulary jumping in and out and it was almost like he'd taken that event oriented improvising approach and applied it to a soloist so like he was having a conversation with himself uh, and it was really striking and interesting what he was doing then. And I feel like he never got acknowledged for that because he never, it never, you know, it, he died before it, um, it really registered. And I, I feel like there's a lot of stuff in his late work I would like to hear. Um, I would like to hear it out there. I hope we could find it. <laughs> there must be some recordings. Yeah, I, I played on the premiere of Zorn's Darts piece uh -huh. i think it was like 84 85 dancers and uh it was me christian mark clay john um i'm trying to think if it was ned rothenberg or who else would have been on it and it was it was all events now that you bring it up yeah and uh cued events right coordinated with queuing uh there was a announcer instead of a conductor David Garland was making announcements of what what we were calling. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, yeah. So I could I could see your point how that then like if you were going to play with Zorn or or Cora at that point you were thinking that way because you know you knew it wasn't about continuity or development per se. Right, and it's a, if you hear um, there's a record that Bob Ostertag did, which is based entirely on samples of Zorn on one side and samples of me on the other side. But the Zorn sample side is almost like somebody taking that approach and caricaturing it because it's sped up. So it's like hearing the Lower East Side improvisation 10 times faster, which is kind of insane. It's a very, it's a very funny record, I think. You know, you mentioned somebody uh, taking on the process of of somebody else and i'm i was fascinated by your record the previous evening from 97 uh -huh. and there were these three pieces one for cage one for feldman and one for earl brown and i, I wanted to ask you about that process because that's that's an interesting record yeah I mean, they were all composed for dance so i i have worked extensively with a choreographer called amanda miller at that time was in based in Freiburg in Germany. She had a dance company called the Pretty Ugly Dance Company. And um, she invited me to write this piece for her. And initially it was right after Cage had died and I wanted to do a kind of an homage to him. So the, the basic piece, um, the, that first part, um, 
was very formally constructed using chance methods and using chance methods to extract text from Cage's writings. And, you know, in other words, it's, it's all based on his approach, um, but seen from my point of view. Um, and it's very formally constructed and has um, non-musical ideas. Like it's, it's got influence a little bit by cinema Foley techniques. So there's a, in that piece, if you're gonna do that live, there's a big, tray of gravel and somebody has to walk in it <laughs> um you know things like that and that i think was um very clear uh, a approach that reflected my approach uh, i learned so much from cage and so it, it reflected that and what did you learn from cage what how was cage in in inspiring to you I read Silence when I was a student back in 767 or so, and it was a revelation in a way that, first of all, a serious composer had a sense of humor. That was good. <laughs> um, but more, it was a question, it's, you know, it's a strangely polemic book in, in you know, a contradictory way, but uh, the idea that the building blocks of music are whatever you want to make them be. So taking away the whole training about notes and harmony and melody and, uh, and going beyond the contemporary music thing of duration and amplitude and uh, you know, they broke it down into those things and he broke it down like, you know, why you don't need an instrument. You know, it's, it's more like, what, how do you choose the sounds you're gonna make for your piece and how do you decide when something's gonna happen and all of that had a very big impact on my thinking about musical form and structure. So and I started experimenting with uh, ideas that I got out of reading Silence back in Henry Cow days, you know. So there was that. On the, on the other hand, there was the fact that he apparently didn't like improvisation. So that I found interesting. And I found it interesting also because, and I tried to have a conversation with him about it because I met him a few times over the years. Um, he came to see a concert I did with Joël Leandre um, and came afterwards to say how much he'd enjoyed it. Yeah, he would show up at concerts. I remember this vividly. Yeah. I would sit next to him at roulette. I would yeah. see him. He would go to improvised music concerts. He seemed perfectly fine and into it. But then I was also at college doing a cage festival and we were presented with all the chance operations and all the, f the ways of formulating these scores. And he was really against the fact that we had put so much personality into it. Right. And that we uh, had, you know. So that, that's, that, that's the root of his um, distaste for improvisation, but it's also, I think, based on a cultural observation. I mean, there wasn't really an improvised scene outside of jazz when he was talking about it. And it's clear that jazz has got nothing to do with what he's trying to do. It's been made out that he's racist because of that. And I, I don't buy that. Um, I think it's much more philosophical about how you tell your story. Um, and he doesn't want you to tell your story. He wants something to happen. Um, and I, I always wanted to engage him in a conversation based on the fact that in the meantime, between 1950 and even 1980, but certainly now, uh, improvisation has completely transformed itself. Um, it's no longer in any way um, idiomatically predictable and there are so many different strands of it and the skill sets that people have are so much more advanced and more sophisticated. And I'm just curious to know whether he would have still had the same resistance to it. But I think maybe that's misplacing what the conversation should have been. And I think He's obviously capable of going to a concert of improvised music and really enjoying it. That was not in doubt. What was in doubt was whether he felt that that was useful to what he was trying to do. Um, and he didn't. So anyway, he, we never had that conversation, but I wanted to. I wanted to know how, how it went for him. Yeah. What, what conversations did you have with him? Very opaque. <laughs> like, you know, oh, I really enjoyed your concert. Oh, has your... Um, has your approach to your thought thinking about improvisation changed in the meantime? Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it was, there was a, not a desire to engage, but I never had the chance to engage with him in a more private context. So it was always in, we were always, I was in packing up my instruments or sitting on a stage with him and 
you know, surrounded by people with big ears. And so it, it was never gonna, we were never gonna have that conversation in that context. And we never had another context to have it in, so. What do you think of his work looking back now? I really love an awful lot of what I hear. And, and there's so little available to listen to because he wasn't a big fan of recording music anyway. So the, for a long time, the only stuff of his I knew was the electronic stuff, Fontana mix and stuff like that. But the prepared piano, the early prepared piano work, um, I just so love that. It's so beautiful. Hard to beat. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, some of the crazy, I mean, Atlas Ellipticalis and the more crazy big scale things, uh, I think are really funny and interesting. Mm. No, I just, uh, it's a rich vein to mine. I still go back to it. Were the graphic scores of guys like Cardew and Earl Brown of interest to you? Uh, absolutely, yeah. No, I had a comp copy of Treatise back in 69 um, and uh, played it many, 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 many times and understood absolutely what doesn't work about it. What doesn't work? Well, the thing is, I've done, you know, forgive me if I sound pontificating, but I've been teaching this for a long time. So it, there's a lot of fixed things in my thinking about it. But I think if you're going to do a graphic score, it's called, it calls itself a score. So then clearly, what, what is the function of a score? The function of a score on some level is to control something. Otherwise, why do you do it? I can just say to you, um, play something or I can give you a picture of something and say, play something. So the picture is supposed to have an effect. Now, is the picture supposed to have an, a, a, an a effect on your emotional state, which you could say that, say, the, um, the text pieces of Stockhausen, um, which are obviously absurd on one level, but nevertheless have a very consistent effect on people interpreting them. So I've never heard somebody interpreting one of those Austin Sieben Tagen pieces without it sounding recognizable. They have that quality, which is a very good quality. <clears throat> so you can mock them all you want, but they do have a consistent effect. And with Cardew, who very strongly resisted ever explaining anything, he was finally bullied into doing notes on treatise, which are not really notes on treatise at all, but something else. <coughs> But um, you, can't let, you can't approach a score like Treatise without examining what it means to be consistent, I think. You look at one page of Treatise, I mean, you have to make certain decisions. If one decision is how long is this gonna be? You can do one page of Treatise for an hour. Mm -hmm. You can do the whole book at a, you know, 10 seconds a page. <laughs> it's, it's uh, infinitely variable question. Um, then the second is like, you know, what is, con what is consistent in the pictures and what's consistent in the, in the graphics are lines and spaces and circles and shapes. So you have triangles, circles, squares, lines, um, very pure conception, sometimes very dense, sometimes not at all dense. This has to mean that they're very different approach to those pages. You can't, you know, you can't look at them and just riff off of them. There has to be some, there has to be some kind of connection. But if you're literal, in other words, if you're um, saying every time there's a circle, I'm going to do this, that also doesn't work in the end because it's 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 losing something essential. You're 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 being too literal in your approach to consistency. And I think that the contradictions inherent in that are very difficult to overcome. And I've done every conceivable kind of approach to it. You know, I've done 20 students playing the whole thing for an hour and, you know, two people playing it for three pages only for five minutes per page or, you know, all of these there are possible variations. Sometimes the music sounds really beautiful. Sometimes it sounds an absolute mess. Sometimes it sounds way too dense. Uh, and in the end, you say, well, I could make those criticisms of just about anything. <laughs> you know, if, if people were improvising, I could say, well, that wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> so then the question is, what is it about treatise that is compelling and useful? And I still don't know the answer to that question. 
<laughs> I find it fascinating to examine. And it's been a super resource in discussing how we improvise and how we develop a vocabulary and how we do those things to think about that. And my own graphic scores are in a way fake graphic scores. They're more like metaphors. I have instructions that go with them that tell you something that you're supposed to do. You're not looking at the score in the abstract and trying to imagine what you're going to do. I'm telling you what to do. So, you know, if, you're, if you look at my score of a stone wall, it consists of each stone being represented as a solo. You play a solo. Um, the first person who I choose plays the first stone. You're building it from the bottom up. And then when I indicate that the second stone is beginning, the first player has to freeze what they're, freeze what they're, freeze what they're, freeze what they're doing at the end of the phrase so that you end up with a loop while the second one's happening. And then the third one happens and you have two loops going on and three loops going on. And so there's a formal process in which there's one person soloing and the other people are freezing their last bit of material. And um, also you could say that the process be, has become audible by about the third person. Absolutely. And it also becomes clear that the conductor has power uh, to try to get the thing that they want them to freeze. So if I hear somebody really showing off, I'm going to say now, <laughs> and then they're stuck with doing something extremely elaborate. Um, but, you know, you can you can fool around with it in, the, in those kinds of ways. But what's interesting about it is, yes, that the process becomes transparent, um, and it's got a consistent and easily understandable set of rules. But what's interesting is that it can be done by any level of player. True. So I've done this with you know eight year olds. And it's easy to understand and it's super fun to do. And, you know, the older, more experienced players can do something completely different with it. Or if you go to a different culture, they may have a completely different take on what it means rhythmically. When I did this in Argentina, everybody played a pulse. It's not in the rules, but we ended up with grooves all the time. <laughs> Why not? Why not? So I I've, I've found working in that way has been super interesting and productive. And, and those graphic scores of mine have been wonderful tools for teaching, for sure. Um, but they're not really graphic scores in the classical sense of the word, or very few of them are. Some of them are, but most of them are kind of. Well, I think they would be like, they would be considered verbal instruction pieces, no? Kind of, except that you do have this image. And so the image is supposed to count for something. Um, what it counts for, I'm not, not exactly sure. Well, do you know the Morton Feldman graphic pieces? I know the, the very early stuff, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And, and those are difficult because they don't have instructions, mostly. They have, they have relative pitch instructions. Yeah. So there's a, there's, a, there's a certain division between high and low pitch, for example. But they don't have dynamic instructions. And you have to assume it being Morton Feldman that it was between quadruple pianissimo and piano. <laughs> but I've seen interpretations by contemporary players who wanted to do that without those restrictions. And then, so then you have the sense of like, okay, we're gonna do this graphic score of Morton Feldman and we're gonna play it forte. And you have to ask yourself, is this being respectful to the composer? Or are you simply dealing with the material for what it says it is? <laughs> without the composer any longer being present. Well, that's why I had trouble with the cage pieces because, you know, at what point am I really supposed to adhere to or be aware of Cage's sound world and what's not in it? But I've just been given such a huge opportunity by the Cage composer to fill in spaces with things that, according to his plan, would be somewhat randomly placed. You know, I, 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 you get into this very interesting zone where you're like, I have to embrace a certain amount of random, but at the same time, I want it to sound good. Now, that's already a problem, right, for Cage, because wanting it to sound good versus bad, I, I should probably tell you this story. Uh, Herb Deutsch, who helped develop the Moog synthesizer, said that he once went up to Mr. Cage and he said, Oh, Mr. Cage, that last piece, it was, it was terrible. Did you hear that? What did you think of that piece? It was just horrible. And Cage said to him, we don't say a piece is good or bad. We say 
it's interesting or not interesting. <laughs> uh huh. So so now that I knew that right, and I'm paying, I'm playing his piece, and I'm involved in a in a whole discussion with myself. Is it interesting or not interesting? Uh -huh. Not is it good or is it bad? And so that's a huge open question, isn't it? Is it interesting? Yes, it is, and of course it wildly subjective. But there is, um, I've played a, one one piece I've played of his that I've played probably more than all the others is four six. You know that one? No. It's basically four players, and you're given. Um, I think you have to choose ten easily reproducible sounds. Um, and then the score consists of time envelopes. So starting at this time, you can now start to do number seven, whatever that is that you've chosen. And you have to stop doing it by this time. So you have two envelopes, one the starting envelope and two the finishing envelope. And then you wait until the next number comes up. And the next number might come up during the closing envelope of the previous one. So then you could go straight into it or you could wait a bit. And so there's a flexibility of when to begin and when to end an event. And that flexibility is informed by what the other three players are doing. So as you listen to what they're doing, it can influence how you decide to bring your sound in. That part of it is intuitive, but the rest of it is not improvised. And it's a mistake that I've heard made by people who perform that piece is to think that it's basically improvised, that you improvise in between those things. But these are, the, what the piece is really about is memory, which is something that fascinates me as a composer anyway. But the idea that you're always doing the same thing when it says seven, and you're always doing the same thing when it says 10. And that when those things come back, the, the audience can hear that you're doing the same thing. That's really important. So what you're hearing is a, a form based on recalling constantly things that you've heard before in juxtaposition with other people who are doing the same thing. And I find that piece is super elegant and beautiful and infinitely variable in an interesting way, given that it's not improvised. <laughs> um, but it has a recognizable form in some way. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's, it's a great piece. I've thought about it a lot. And, you know, Music is all about memory in the end, isn't it? It's like, it doesn't matter if it's Mozart or anything else. It's your, you recall hearing something before, that's how variation works. That's how development works. It's your understanding of what there was before in order to get to where you are now. So yeah. that's important. Now, well, how did you approach Feldman when you did the previous evening? That was, uh, both the Feldman and the Brown pieces were much less considered from my point of view. They were. Amanda asked me to do them, having done finished the case piece and thinking that's what I was doing. She said, I need two more movements. And then I thought, okay, well, I'll do that. And then it was super intuitive. I didn't, I just did something kind of like based on my own feeling about Feldman and Brown. And so it was less formally rigorous from one point of view and certainly I think one misunderstanding that people had about the Feldman piece is they think that when a composer is doing an homage to somebody, it should sound like that somebody. And I'm saying, you know, it's like when David Hockney was talking about his paintings of the Grand Canyon. Uh, I never forgot this uh, interview I saw him give. He said, when you see my painting of the Grand Canyon, you're not looking at the Grand Canyon, you're looking at me looking at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> And I'm thinking that's exactly it. You know, you're not listening to Morton Feldman, you're listening to me listening to Morton Feldman. And so um, it's a response from my sensibility and my history and my practice to what I've learned from Morton Feldman. So that's what that piece is. It doesn't sound anything like Morton Feldman. Not supposed to. <laughs> no, but it's your response to Feldman. Yeah. Nirvana for mice was my response to John Cage. I mean, who knew? <laughs> Is it really? It was entirely made with chance methods, believe it or not. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought that. When I, when I say entirely, of course, I'm lying, but um, the durations of the measures were all 
generated by chance methods. And the, gen and the pitch of the first saxophone was entirely methods. So then I added a second saxophone and the chords, <laughs> and those were not chance methods. So I took the chance methods and then framed them with something else, which was very anti-Cage, of course, but that's my response to Cage in 1970. Well, the response is, how are you going to uh, accommodate or um, or give some sort of uh, resonance to your response to Cage that, or, or to any of the guys we're talking about in a way that makes it filter through your prism, through your, uh, your musicality. And the idea that it could be part random or part chance operation and part composition, of course, is very postmodern and interesting. <laughs> Definitely not what Cage would have appreciated, but that's okay. Well, I also saw him get angry at an audience for, uh, you know, a 433 performance. Because oh. he thought the audience wasn't uh, quiet enough. And I found that interesting, too, because, well, they weren't instructed. What do you think could happen? One of X possibilities is the audience will make some sounds. Right. I mean, I, this is an example of being trapped in your own icon, iconic status. Um, everybody knows that piece and that people have varying responses to it, some of which find it, they find it ridiculous, some of which they actually understood what he was trying to do. But you can't guarantee which proportion of who is going to be in the audience and I felt very sorry for Cage because of the way that piece became him. If you read his obituaries, they're all about 433. I mean, and it's a fascinating and beautiful piece, which is almost never possible to play anymore without in, 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 interference from some other part of your uh, engaged audience. And there are so many other pieces to consider. And he's got such a rich body of work. Oh, granted. But do you think that the, the point of, sorry, the point of that piece is, is to achieve silence? Absolutely not. The point of that piece is to listen and to understand that silence is not going to happen. So if you're seriously sitting there listening to that piece, you will hear all kinds of things and they will be truly random. <laughs> and so in a way, it's a very um, didactic piece about this process. Um, I have my students um, go do sound walks quite a lot. And the only rules are no cell phones and no talking. So we'll walk for an hour in silence in different places, completely different kinds of environments. And we have conversations afterwards about what we heard and stuff. But what's interesting is how, um, if I try to get people to play what they heard what you can't do is um, is is do something unintentional. And everything you hear when you're out on a walk is unintentional. So you can hear beautiful juxtapositions of unexpected things happening when you're walking. You know, a perfect decrescendo of a car with some raindrops with this and that. Um, but if you try to reproduce it because you're intending to, it's never going to have the same resonance as something which doesn't have intention. And so that's, uh, for me, that's an interesting point of discussion as to what intentionality and what it brings to an improvisation, for example, what, what's the function of it. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> no, you make a good point. Yeah, I, I guess the, the only other thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, what are you up to? What's keeping you busy these days? And, uh, you know, what's music for Fred Frith now? Right now, um, in the pandemic situation, I've done a lot of um, preparing archival recordings for release. <laughs> I'm composing. Um, I've just finished a piece for trumpet, two trombones, two baritone saxes, and two bass saxes for a French septet. Um, preparing some music for my trio because we're going to go out on the road in March of 2022. So we will have some time to rehearse and think about that. Um, 
And other than that, I've also been um, trying to bring, do the kinds of administrative stuff that I never have time to do, like rationalizing my gamer. You know, I'm a member of gamer, not ASCAP. And I discovered that gamer has misregistered about half of my work. So I've been painstakingly going through the whole archive and putting things straight and hoping that this will have some effect on my income, which is of course a joke. But we've all been feeling the pinch in this <laughs> pandemic year. So every bit helps. So that's what I'm doing. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a time to, uh, to take stock of some things. Yeah. I just released three box sets of my entire Fred Records catalog. So with extra CDs in each one and three booklets full of me yabbing on about that stuff. So that sounds great. Where can people find those? RER, RER Megacorp. So it's available if there's any left. It was, a, it was a way to get rid of stock, basically. Nobody buys CD, so. Well, I look forward to checking that stuff out, Fred Frith. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. OK, everybody, that's Fred Frith. He's the man. Keep doing, doing all that great stuff, Fred. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll, we'll see you next time. Bye.